Our superpower as a human that makes us different from every other animal species is that we have the power of choice. That's our superpower as a human. So the first step is awareness because you have to know what it is or shed the light on. If you go into a dark room, you can't see anything. But when you turn on the light, you see everything. So when you raise your awareness, then you can actually notice what you need to work on, shift, move, clean out, declutter, whatever that may be. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living Podcast, where we are reimagining and redefining what it means to be in midlife, where we are gathering energy, momentum, and excitement for our next chapter via candid conversations with other midlifers about their own pivots, pitfalls, and triumphs. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Those of you who have been listening to this podcast for a while have probably heard me tell the story about how committing to a daily yoga practice has been a game changer for me. I have to tell you, my 40s were a challenging decade for me, mentally and physically. I was scrambling to keep up with work and trying to be a good mom to young kids. And I never felt like I was doing anything well. I was always tired and I didn't feel like myself. I had always been an optimist, but at that point in my life, I felt cranky and tired most of the time. I was first introduced to yoga through um, a theater company I worked with in my 20s. And man, I was amazed at how, especially after the first couple of them, I was so amazed at how a really good yoga session could leave me feeling energized, relaxed, and even a little euphoric. But you know, I didn't give myself the gift of doing yoga regularly until a little over a year ago. I took stabs at it, but it was never, never consistent. And that's true of anything having to do with really taking care of myself. I was sporadic about exercising and meditating. I would do it in fits and starts and I would instantly feel better for for it. But then it seemed I'd always end up with an injury that would derail me for a few weeks or months or something would come up in life and I would just lose the thread. And... I have to wonder how many people listening are having some sort of a challenge with chronic pain or some sort of illness. And that is why I am so happy to introduce you to today's guest, because her story should show you what's possible. It is possible to heal and to make a comeback. I've heard the stories time and time again from people who faced enormous challenges with their health and then overcame those challenges. And I want you to know it's possible for you too. My guest today is Debbie Robinson. At 51, Debbie had a total hip replacement. At 51, that's young. And she understands what it feels like to be what she describes as handicapped, broken, and sad. She had been a very active person before an injury to her hip that uh, left her in chronic pain for years before she even had her surgery. And that experience inspired her in 2014 to get certified to teach yoga for osteoporosis. She's since helped many people strengthen their bones, their bodies, and their minds through yoga therapy. And I can't wait for you to hear her story. Let's go. Hi, Debbie. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Um, So I always like to say how I met people and my new favorite place, I think everybody's starting to know, is Clubhouse. That's where you and I connected. And uh, I'm having so much fun there. Are you? Yeah, it becomes a little bit of an obsession. (laughs) And a few hours have gone by and I'm like, oh my gosh, this room is still going on. It's been three hours. (laughs) So yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's a great place to meet people, to network, and to learn a lot of valuable information. Yeah. Yeah. I found it to be the same thing. It's been amazing like um, meeting you there and um, the, another person that I just interviewed this morning also met through Clubhouse, for, uh, interviewed her for the podcast. And the conversations 
I mean, I've been in so many different kinds of rooms and I'm just finding so much value there. I, I am having to really manage myself and not be in there all the time, but, uh, but it is, it is addictive warning, warning to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that I heard about your experience um, was when you started talking about the, the journey that, that you had when you had a hip injury and how, how pivotal that was for you, that change, and really sent you down a new road. So that, was, that got me really excited to talk to you about what's going on and, and how that, you know, what you, what you made happen from that experience, I think is really incredible. Yeah. The lemonade I made out of those lemons. Yes. Yeah. Um, it was, yes. I received an injury in my early forties. And at that time I was a very active person. I played tennis four to five days a week. I was spinning, running very, very active. And it's like in one moment when I received that injury, my whole life shifted and it didn't just happen overnight, but over the next five years, there was a degeneration in that joint and I had to stop living my life. So slowly, but surely I would stop playing tennis. I would stop spinning at the gym because after playing tennis or after spinning, my body would be throbbing in pain. And then it got to a point where even walking. So once I finally got down to my last physical thing I was doing, which is walking about a mile into my walk, I would start to feel this throbbing and every night in bed, sleep was a difficult um, situation for me, tossing and turning. And I was taking Advil all the time. And I, of course I had tried to figure out what's, what's wrong. I went to an orthopedic surgeon. He ordered an MRI of my low back because even though I told him it's my hip, he thought it was my low back. Um, so I never had definitive imaging of my hip joint to say what it really was. And then five years, um, I was in Europe and we were in Paris. We walked a mile and a half and it was so hard for me to do that walk. And I had to go back to the hotel room, put my legs up the wall and take three Advil. And I don't really like to take Advil. So that's, you know, a, something that uh, became a signal for me that I needed to figure this out. So I went to an orthopedic surgeon and he ran an MRI and I was diagnosed with a torn labrum. And he said he would do a surgery for me, an arthroscopic surgery. So I had surgery number one, five years after my injury and it didn't work. Oh. And I, I had gone five years with this injury. So there was so much wear and tear in my body. And, you know, you don't really realize how little your life gets until you realize how little it is. So my life became this small box that I functioned in. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it was gradual. It's like that, that image, what do they say? You, you drop the the, the frog into the boiling water and it'll, it'll jump right out. But if you leave it in the water and bring that water up to the boil, the, the frog doesn't know the difference. They, they, they acclim, acclim, that acclimates to, to the hot water. And that sounds like that was your experience was you were suddenly, you were slowly losing your, your activities and the things that you loved. Is that a yeah. fair comparison? Yeah, it was, a, it's just, you just realize like, oh, wow, I can't do this anymore. I can't do that anymore. And yeah, you just don't realize it. And then of course I thought, okay, I'm going to have the surgery, which, you know, wasn't fun. And who the heck wants to go through surgery, right? more medications I can't stand to take. So there's anti-inflammatories, there's all the preventative antibiotic use that you have to take. Then there's all of those chemicals going through your body for the surgery. Um, when he came out, he said, let's see if this works. And I didn't realize what he meant by that. And three months later, my joint completely collapsed. Hmm. Um, and he had mentioned that if you feel a sharp pain in the front of your growing area, the groin area, that that's not good. And I felt that at the three month mark. Oh. Um, so yeah, long story short with that, I, I spent 19 months thinking, okay, I'm going to try to heal myself. I'm going to strengthen what I need to strengthen, lengthen what I need to lengthen, use my yoga therapy, try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And it didn't work. 
So I had a total hip replacement when I was 51 years old. Hmm. That's young. It is young. And to make the decision to go in and to have somebody cut the top of your leg bone yeah. that you stand on, that's, that stabilizes you, that supports you to make that decision is such a hard decision to come to. And it only happens when the living gets so hard and painful because I was handicapped at this point in my life. I had a handicaps placard and I needed it. I, I'm, and not only did I need it, you become it. Mm-hmm. And that's, what's really hard. And because I am such a happy camper and a optimist, the glass is always half full for me. I really realized how that was shifting for me that to ha- be in chronic pain on a daily basis, to not be able to walk, to move, to explore, to, to live your life is so hard. And I was only 50 years old. Yeah. I, so, so this is, this is the thing. I am not afraid of dying, but I am afraid of not being able to move myself of my own accord from place to place and do the things that I want to do in life. You know, we that, have to move to be healthy and we have to move to live. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's huge. Uh, it it's must have really, been so hard. Yeah. Well now looking back, cause now I'm almost four years out. Right. So now I get to look back and really, you know, they say hindsight is 2020. And so then you get to see like, wow, really? That's what was happening. And you know, you're in it when you're in the thickness and the heaviness, like in the quicksand aspect, you can't always see, you know, it's kind of that analogy. You can't see the forest for the trees. Mm-hmm. And then when you lift yourself up and out and you can look down and back, it's like, wow. So I usually take my hands and I make the shape of a box and I say, this is where my life became in this little box. And it's really the mental emotional layer is where I noticed so much of the the heaviness. And it's what really made me decide that this needs to stop because I am such a happy camper. Like I choose happiness. I really Every day I choose to enjoy life, to be happy. I choose to look at the glass as half full. I choose to not suffer because I do think it is a choice. And then it becomes what steps do I need to implement into my life to move away from suffering, whether that's physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual. Yeah. So you had the surgery, you had the hip replacement surgery and what happened afterwards? So I had the hip replacement surgery. And the the interesting thing is, is that the year prior to that surgery, every doctor, PT or chiropractor that tested my body for arthritis, which is what they do to see how bad your joint is, your line on the table. I always tested perfect. I didn't walk with the limp because I'm a yoga therapist. I would work on that. So after the surgery, What was really amazing for me is all the yoga, the physical asana that I was practicing leading up to that surgery prepared me to heal at a really quick pace. So 10 days after my surgery, I started teaching again and I taught seven classes. What? Yeah. I, and my students were shocked. I stood, I stood on that leg in tree pose and they were looking at me and it was just you know, there's the, there's the overcoming the physical aspect of whatever's happening in your body. And then there's overcoming the fear and the mental emotional layer. Mm -hmm. So it's overcoming the physical and overcoming the mental emotional. And Mm -hmm. that was intriguing for me to see what that journey and process has been like. Wow. So you were already doing the yoga therapy before your surgery. Yeah. So before my, I had one surgery and then I had the next. So that was a 19 month time frame, And I was with a physical therapist the whole time I was in school at the time for yoga therapy. And that's a thousand hours of training with doctors, physical therapists, chiropractors, nurses. And so everything that I was learning, I was using on myself. I was teaching eight classes a week at a hospital in Southern California. And so I was teaching and I know myself that I actually stopped doing and modeling for them. You know, you have to um, demo what you're doing. So I became so good at articulating and cueing 
and helping people find within their bodies the whatever I was trying to guide them towards. Um, so yeah, so I did all that. And I think that that's what helped me recover at my five and a half week post-op. My doctor pull, um, was so shocked. He pulled the other physician out of his office and said, look at her. She's only five weeks post-op. And um, yeah, so that it had was, to feel pretty good. It did. You know, I didn't get, I, you do get no more pain and you get your life back. Okay. But there is still that fear yeah. Can I, should I, is this safe? Will the glue, is the glue holding? Will I dislocate this hip? Can I stretch this deeply? Is it okay to walk here? Can I stand on this leg? There's all of that trepidation mm -hmm. that comes at the beginning of the recovery process. Yeah. And that lives in your body too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So so you are how many years post post surgery now? I'm almost four years. Mm -hmm. um, on my six month post op visit, I arrived in India. My first visit to India, I climbed a very sacred mountain there. So when the doctor asked me, "What are you not doing in your life that you want to do?" Because that was the quality of life question at the end of the questionnaire, and I said, "I want to walk again." That's all I was going to ask for. I said, "And if I may be so bold." Can I ask for one more thing? I'd like to be able to hike too, if that's possible. Because I thought, okay, I could give up tennis. I could give up the gym and running and spinning. You know, I'm getting older anyway. And I think a lot of that faster paced movement really burns through our internal cellular energy. Um, so I was, I'll walk and hike, please. And so I arrived in India six months post-op. I hiked a very sacred mountain. And then I went to the Taj Mahal. Wow. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I wish people could see your face right now because you're just glowing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty. I got my life back. Yeah. You know, I, got, I got my life back. And I was only 50 when I made this decision or 51, 50, 51, right around that time. It was right after my birthday. My dad was getting ready to turn 89. And this is the thought that caused me to say yes to the hip replacement. I may have 40 plus more years to live. Mm -hmm. I may only be halfway through this journey of life. Yeah. I cannot live in this tiny box. And that is what made me say yes to the hip replacement. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much left ahead. You know, I think we get, we get to, you know, close to our fifties and I, th I think there's a, the old idea, I think there's a new, a new awareness of that longevity that we still have ahead of us based on where we're at with medical technology and just people's health and, and, and everything. But I think there's still old ideas about aging that are so deep within our subconscious that there's almost this sense of exhaustion maybe for people by the time they get to midlife and at having worked so hard and overcome so much already. And I think that there's a tendency to, to want to rest on our laurels or just relax. And I think for me, I feel like to stay excited about the next 30 to 40 years, I need more than that. I need to step into to new experiences and, and, um, and maybe even things that are a little bit scary. Do you, it sounds, I mean, how do you, what do you think about that? Where are you in that? Okay, Yvonne, you're speaking my language. I call it the butterfly effect. And I don't even know if that's really a coined term. So if it is, I need to change my terminology there. When we live in a place where we feel the butterflies in our stomach, we're actually challenging ourselves and we're putting ourselves out there in whatever way that means. So if you can be in that butterfly effect, what's going to happen is growth. And that's where growth happens. So you either stay in the comfortable stuck or you go into the uncomfortable growth. And that is what I am doing in my life right now. 
because I know that I have something very valuable to share. I know that my journey happened for a reason. And I always say that when people say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I say, no, 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 it was meant to happen to me. Um, because this, my injury actually happened from a yoga teacher pushing my body and tearing my hip. And I felt it happen when it happened. And I realized that that was supposed to happen for me to be where I am. And so we can take the word stress and this word stress can it either be a negative and cause all of this problems in our lives. And that's called distress. There's also another side of stress called eustress. Mm -hmm. And whenever there's a challenge where there's a potential for growth, then you can actually grow. And so for me, it's the butterfly effect. And I try to live in the butterfly place every day. I try to do something every day that pushes me to grow, to expand and to become what I believe I am meant to be doing. Yes, 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 yes. I call, I have, I actually wrote something a, a while back that um, where it occurred to me that I think, you know, that, that whole idea of the fountain of youth, mm -hmm. I feel like the, the real fountain of youth is that is what you call the butterfly effect is stepping into new experience, learning, being a beginner at something and being willing to be vulnerable in that way that we were as kids where you're trying something new for the first time and you do, and I described it the same way, that sense of the excitement that feels like butterflies in your stomach when you're stepping into doing something for the first time ever. And that is like just talking about it, I can feel the excitement of like, oh, I'm doing this for the first time ever. There's something so powerful in that of, of you know, just being open to not having to be good at something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's very not having to have it all figured out already. Yeah. It's very liberating. You know, for, for me, the whole wisdom in yoga is that me, who I am, is not what you see. So I live in something it's called my body. So I'm living in here, but I am really life energy. And when I think of myself that I'm not my body and I'm not my mind. And if I think about myself as an energetic being, then I want that energetic being to be as bright and shiny as it can and as big as it can. So I kind of step aside from the me part of all of this and I look at it of expanding my essence. And that's actually really freeing of the, you know, all of the things that we feel, the negative feelings, the imposter syndrome, the lack, the self-doubt, when I take the, the me out of it, the small S self out of it, and I think of the big S self that is Debbie, then I'm not really, I'm not, it's not really me that's doing it. It's this bigger um, aspect of me. And that actually is very helpful for me. The witness yeah. that, that, that if I were going to say, if I were going to teach one tool for people, it would be to be a witness, to be a witness of yourself when you're speaking, to be a witness of yourself when you're feeling to become a witness when, when you talk about getting older and any of the negative feelings that come with aging, you're not aging. The package you live in is, and you have to take care of the package you live in because that's my experience. This is why I'm here. This is my message. My package broke at 50 and I'm only halfway done. So I'm here to share that this package degenerates I've had it happen to me artificially. And more importantly, I work with the 60 plus crowd and I see the breakdown in people's bodies. So if we do not use it, we lose it. And it's hard for us to be happy when what we live in breaks or wears down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, and you were doing the yoga therapy before or getting trained, right? And then the hip, the experience with your hip, is that what turned you on to working with people 60 plus? Is that where your, your sense of um, expansion of yourself came from? Well, it's really 55 plus. And I do have people that are in their forties too, but I'd say the majority is 55 plus. Uh -huh. So I became a teacher. I became a yoga teacher in 2010. And that's when my injury happened. 
when I was going to get my first surgery and I was trying to figure out what's wrong with my hip, that led me to yoga therapy because I understood it would be a much deeper learning experience. And I wanted to learn more and I love the wisdom of yoga. Mm -hmm. So I had my surgery on November 3rd and I had started my yoga therapy training two weeks before. And on my next yoga therapy class, I was in a wheelchair because I was at a university in Southern California and I needed to get from my car to the room. And so I had to take a wheelchair because I couldn't bear weight for six weeks. I even taught classes in a wheelchair. Um, wow. so yoga therapy happened because I wanted to know more about my body and how to heal myself. And then I learned about the depths of yoga and that yoga is so much more than the body. It's really about the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been transformational for me to, I mean, I've been, I, I started doing yoga in my late twenties, I would say, um, with a theater company that I was working with, they, they had a great yoga teacher who would come in with us once a, once a week. And, and that got me really curious. And then I started doing it kind of, uh, dabbling, I would say. And as I got to the end of my, as I was reaching the end of my forties, I realized how, I mean, I had known for years that that when I did do yoga, I felt better. And, and I don't just mean my body. I mean, myself felt better. My whole outlook was better on a day that I did yoga. And I didn't do it every day though. And I'm like, why? What was I hold? Why? And I, I know why I was, I had kids late. So they were little and I was doing the working mom, raising young kids. It was the, the grind of just getting through the day, but I wasn't taking care of myself, you know, mm -hmm. and boy, what a difference it made when I decided to just say, nope, this is it. This is the line in the sand every day. Or, you know, even if I don't do yoga every day, it's, it's really like at least like five days a week, you know, but yeah. exercise every day, some sort, some sort of felt self-care and the meditation. I mean, just, just, and that was something else that I dabbled with here and there, you know, oh, let's try a little bit, you know, and I'd go to sleep while I was doing it. I'd be lying down, you know, just wasn't really fully engaged and really, really stepping in and taking it on, man, it has just changed my life. Yeah. So I'd like to say that there's a book that is the reference book, the guidebook for yoga that most modern yoga is based on that we use in the West. And many of the teachers that are in this space, that's the book that we use called the Yoga Sutras. And it's mm -hmm. 195 or 96 lines, depending on which version you use. So out of 196 lines, which are, they're called slok shlokas, and they are meaty, they're very um, little pearls of wisdom. Out of 196, three of them are on the physical aspects of the practice of yoga, three out of 196, and everything else is on the mind. Mm -hmm. And yoga, the physical asana that you do on a mat is a very small part of yoga. It's the tip of the iceberg. And you said that when you would practice it, and I'm assuming you mean the physical asana, that you would feel better because yoga is about balancing our energy, physically, mentally, emotionally. And so when you practice on a mat and you're moving your body and you're breathing, you're connecting mind, body, and breath, that's yoga. And so you are harmonizing your body and that's where those good feelings come from. Meditation is the goal and the deeper aspects of yoga is meditation. And also there's, there's uh, tools for the way that we live, like mindset pieces, which I think is such a huge part to health and healing is shifting our mindset, the way that we show up in life which is, I think a lot of what you're doing with your podcast is raising that awareness of, okay, it's not over now. What now what's when you know, now, what are we going to do in our lives? So right. yeah, yoga is more about the mind than it is about the body. Yoga is something you do all day, every day. It doesn't have to be on a mat. It can be that when you're sitting, you take the break to connect to your breath for mm. one breath for five breaths for five minutes. And it's just that time of recalibrating yourself all day, every day 
with life, with, with nature, with the present moment, staying in this present moment. And that is what that's, that's yoga. Mm. Yes. I love that explanation of it. That's great. Wow. So just amazing. I mean, I'm looking at like from the first time we talked, you know, I know that you, you, you lost your mobility in my notes here. It says you were, you know, 51, you gained 30 pounds, right? And yes, 30 pounds less now, four years later than I was four years ago. I can't even, I, I knew, I know what it felt like. I know how it was like shackles. I know that it was so restrictive in many ways and it really clouded my light and me and who I am. But now it's like, wow, really? I, 30 pounds. That's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. It is. It's, yeah. it's like, it's amazing. Like you must feel so, I, I mean, I'm just going to say you must feel so much lighter, like to not have to carry that around. On so many levels, right? It's not even just my yeah. body. Um, but I will, I just want to say something about this because this is really important. When our joints start to break down, which, you know, our body starts to break down in our thirties for all of us, there's no free passes. The bones start to shift the process of remodeling in the mid thirties, the muscles in the thirties or forties. So there's this breakdown that happens in our body. And it's really important to know that and to stay ahead of that and to realize that we can, that we actually can do that. We can shift and stay on top of how we're aging. I think that's yeah. really important. Yeah. Did you, so I'm, I'm just curious when, so you had, you had your surgery, but so much of this was a, a mental game for you. It sounds like Yeah. what did besides the surgery and the recovery from that and having that, that clear, um, healing from, from that, did you change your own habits? Your, how did you get back to being the sunny self that you are? Well, okay. And I want to finish at, um, answering because I, I know I didn't finish that last question answering because there was one thing I did want to point out and I kind of got sidetracked in my thinking is the whole weight component. We were talking about that 30 pounds. Yeah. One of the things that doctors will tell you when your joints are degenerating and people will tell you this is lose weight. And so I knew that excessive weight was worse for my joints. We know that we know that extra weight on joints can contribute to more breakdown in the joints. But when you can't move, when your body is so broken and you're in this small space, you can't move. So you're hearing lose weight. You feel bad because you're gaining weight. And then you, it's just, it's just a hard place to be. And, yeah, and then you're blaming yourself, right? You're blaming then, yourself. I was mortified. I'd go to right. the physical therapist or soft tissue specialist. My t tummy was so big. I actually, the, when I went to go have my hip replacement, I weighed the same amount of weight that I weighed the day that I came home from giving birth with all three children. I mean, there's this one number on the scale that that number was there from mm -hmm. every, every, the, the day I came home from the hospital. I mean, with, you know, heavy breasts full with milk for my babies and all of, I mean, it's just like, that's where I got to again, that place. So you asked, how did I find happy again? Well, it's a slowly but surely process. And for me, it is ancient wisdom practices of yoga. It's that wisdom that I learned about how important it is to live in the present moment, how important it is to not allow the brain to be in the subconscious place where the thoughts are, whether that's the negative mind, the mind of the past, the mind of the future. When we get out of the way and we let our mind either come to the conscious mind or stop that chatter that happens in our mind, then what happens above happens below. And there's a trickle down effect that inside your body. Now you actually calibrate your physiology and your biochemistry. And that contributes to weight loss, to better function. And all of these things together is what creates happy. You know, it's not just a one thing. I mean, if I had to say one thing I do, it's yoga. Okay. But yoga, meaning breath, meditation, present moment, living, physical movement, um, yeah, but it, okay. If I were going to say one, my one word, I'm going to say the one word 
to increase your happy is to change your mindset. It's a mindset shift. Yeah. And if I'm hearing right, the mind shift, uh, the mindset shift <laughs> comes from practice, an ongoing practice, because it's not something that just, it's not like, oh, just change your mindset, right? It's, it is ongoing. I think you said if you could just be, um, if you could just be, maybe I'm putting this into my own words now, but what I took from what you were saying earlier was to be, to raise your own awareness of your thoughts. And, and then from there, from that place of awareness, then you have choice. Am I on target? Yeah. Well, our, our superpower as a human that makes us different from every other animal species is that we have the power of choice. That's our superpower as a human. So the first step is awareness because you have to know what it is or shed the light on. If you go into a dark room, you can't see anything, but when you turn on the light, you can see everything. So when you raise your awareness, then you can actually notice what you need to work on, shift, move, clean out, declutter, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. So it's that raise awareness piece. And then for me, it's that whole witness practice where I actually become a witness so in conversations, it's almost like I'm standing behind myself to notice, is the voice that wants to come up in this conversation being triggered by fear or scarcity? Am I being defensive? Am I speaking my truth? And I look at how I'm showing up in conversations or throughout my day, are these acts of self-care for me, for the package that I live in, which contains me? Am I nourishing my bones, my muscles, my hormones, my brain, or am I blocking energy and the flow of energy in my being, my body, my being, whatever you want to term it as. So yeah, it's that raised awareness piece. And then when you bring in that raised awareness that you are this divine being, that you're this energy source, then you want to take care of you. And especially when you start to put yourself out there in the way that I am now, I want my light to shine bright and I want my light bulb to not be cloudy. So that means I have to eat, breathe, sleep, think, move in a way that is going to benefit me. And that all leads to happy and to healthy and flowing and mobility. Yeah. And when you talk about putting yourself out there, what, what, is, tell me what that means for you. Well, we're all here for a divine purpose. We all have something we're here for. And so I have three children. I raised my three children and now it's my turn. And so I am taking my experience, my journey and what I've learned along the way through my health coaching. I'm also a certified health coach and my yoga therapy, and then all my experience of all the people I've worked with over the years and all that they share with me, the testimonials of what's happening in their lives and how they're finding their happy place physically and mentally. And so what I'm doing now by putting myself out there is I'm sharing my journey and sharing, spreading the wisdom that I learned. So I teach, I teach um, physical classes, I have webinars and courses, and my real specialty that actually came to me is bone health. And I do have a hip replacement, which most people don't in their 50s. And the biggest fear with osteoporosis is a fractured hip because 50% of the people that fall and break their hip will not survive. 50%. Isn't that a crazy statistic? It's a crazy statistic. So 25% will die from the injury. 25% will go into a home to never come out. And usually within a year, because they're not mobile anymore, will pass. One in two women, this is the big one, okay? One in two women over the age of 50 will have a break in her lifetime due to osteoporosis. Wow. We have a greater chance of breaking a bone from osteoporosis than we do from breast, uterine, and ovarian cancer combined. Really? Yes, yes. Wow. That puts so, a lot of things in perspective, doesn't it? 
It really does. And so when you ask me about my light, I read that and I'm like, oh my goodness, I have work to do. And so I'm here to raise awareness to that, to raise awareness to those of us that are in our fifties that wouldn't even ever think that we're going to break a bone one day, or wouldn't even think that maybe our joints are going to collapse in our feet, our arches, or that we're going to have wear and tear in our kneecap and our meniscus is going to shred, or our hip joint is going to collapse, or our um, vertebral discs are degenerating and that we're going to wake up 20 years from now in pain and immobile. So I want to say, uh, uh, this is what could be ahead. Let's not get there. And daily habits now will help you. So you don't arrive there 20 mm-hmm. years. Yeah. And if there already let's, let's back up because I did, because I, I, my world expanded and I know it's possible. So that's, that's, yeah, that's my yeah. light. Yeah. When you and then so so I'm I I I don't know why I'm I'm glomming onto this, but I find it interesting that you put, you said when you in order to put yourself out there, are you naturally comfortable at, in this role of teacher or putting yourself like you know marketing your business? Does, or is that something that you've had to overcome in order to get your message out and fill your purpose? Oh my gosh. Lack is the biggest thing that is out there for so many of us, right? The, who am I? Mm -hmm. Can I, should I, uh, my first visit to India in 2017, I started having some pretty profound dreams and really realized where my hurdles are, where are my speed bumps in my path of me feeling like I should, or I can, or who am I? It's part of what I came from. My parents are British, they're Scottish. And I used to always hear, don't be too big for your boots. Mm -hmm. I think that in the States, in America, they say, don't be too big for your britches, Mm -hmm. right? So I think that there are things that we've been told our whole lives, maybe especially to females more than males that have been stifling and kept us small. So it is an ongoing process for me every day to tell myself that yes, you can, yes, you should. Even when I received the testimonials that I receive, the emails, I had a woman the other day after class, she's 87 years old. And she said to me, she said, Debbie, I am in the shape that I'm in today. And I'm able to move my body and live my life the way I do today. And she said, I believe in large part, it's because of the years of practice with you. And she's been with me for about six years. And that's one person that tells me this. And I get an email or another person said, I'm 78 pain-free and feeling great. Thanks to you. And, and it's, it's over and over. So I take that and I say, Debbie, you see, yes, look at, you should be doing this. And I know in my heart of hearts that what I'm doing is helping so many. I know that I keep people safe because of my experience. And, you know, you said something really interesting. I wanted to get back to you said something about beginner mind, that when you put yourself out there, that you try to go to that beginner mind. So in Buddhism, there is a quote that talks about the beginner mind and the beginner body. There's a beginner mind, beginner body. So when we talk about yoga, we talk about a person in the beginning, they're in the beginner mind and the beginner body. And so when you're trying to do these postures in your body, right? (laughs) Yes. These weird postures, right? Yeah. (laughs) Those crazy things, right? Which most of you know, it's not really for those of us that are, you know, at a certain age or have issues in our tissues. Um, so that beginner body, you've got to go slow and, and do things. And then there's that beginner mind piece. And that's what I think happened to me is that I went back to beginner mind. And so I could show up for the students that I show up for and be in their head space. And then with my journey of pain every day, limited range of motion, pain with motion, and then not wanting to poke the monster because you poke the monster when you have a chronic pain place and you don't want to do that. So there's that fear that gets you like shriveled and Mm -hmm. all day. Mm -hmm. So all of that comes with me when I talk about shining my light, put myself out there. I keep telling myself, look, how many more signs do you need that? Yes, you should be doing this. You are there to help all of these people. The person that's gained 40 pounds that has knee issues and they're being told to lose weight, but they can't move and they're scared to move. 
and the 70 something year olds that want to live this strong, healthy, active life, but they don't know what joints they need to focus on or what things they need to do or get out of their head or eat better or sleep better or all of the lifestyle behaviors that will actually allow us to age strong, healthy, pain-free and show up at 80, almost like you're 50, but with gray hair. Yeah. So you're getting, so you're getting all these signs that are like, Debbie, keep going, Debbie, keep going. And yes. what is the part of you that's, that, that is doubtful, fearful? What's that part about? Well, I, you know, I, I see it all over the place and I see it with people, even people that are famous singers or actors. And they talk about going on the stage and how they're so nervous. It's like, what? You're so talented. You're so good. What are you doing? So I also listen to the people that are already out there doing things and they share how they're fearful. And I'm like, okay, well, gosh, if they're feel fearful and they can do it. Um, so it's a daily self-talk of overcoming. And, and like I said, that witness practice where I stand and I, I say, where is that coming from Debbie? Is that from your grandmother? Is that from your mother? Is that from your great grandmothers? Is that because, is that your Irish heritage? Is that your Scottish heritage? Is that because you're female and females have always been put in their place or thought they had to be in a certain place? Mm -hmm. So I really try to really look bigger at it, not just me in this physical body that I'm living in, but really the depths of where are these voices or these limitations or restrictions coming from. Mm -hmm. And I try to overcome them. And so that every day when I put myself in the butterfly stomach place, I do it. And, you know, we met on clubhouse my first day, two hours in, I went into a room. It says chat. I didn't know what the heck that meant. And some guy answered and I was like, Oh my gosh, my stomach, my heart started accelerating. Well, <laughs> yes. the, the sympathetic branch of the nervous system was full force. Mm -hmm. My, my lungs, my heart was beating. My breath was shallow. I could feel my body like floating up off the chair and I could, I hoped that there wasn't a lightness in my voice. I try to ground myself. So I would sound a little bit more like, okay. I'm like, Oh, sorry. I didn't even know this was this. Okay. Then I ended up in a room because of that. So there's also, I also look at the signs. So I said that I get signals and signs. So I look at, I think that the universe you know, call it what you want. I try to be careful with my terminology because I don't want people, it's, you know, if somebody has a certain way of believing, I want them to believe whatever they call their, their sign maker, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that gives them their signs or protects them and guides them. So I feel this guidance and I feel that I'm being guided. And, you know, the word karma, I think a lot of people know that word karma. So I think I have a lot of good karma in my life and that I, I always say that, thank you. I must've done a lot of great stuff in my past lives or life, or, you know, some people may believe this, I do. Um, and so I am feel the guidance, you know, and that conversation with that guy put me into a room with some very big players in the health coaching space, which is in the wellness space that I'm in. Um, because I also am a certified health coach and I help people transform their health by running functional labs and then putting them on a new lifestyle and behavior routine. And I was in this big room like 200 people with big players. And that guy that I had the chat with said, I want to shout out to Debbie because I just talked to her 30 minutes ago. They pulled me up on stage, which is what it's called on clubhouse. Right. And I'm talking, I'm talking on stage and I felt butterflies and you know, the, the um, stress response actually brings a lightness into your body, right? So in yoga, we, we balance everything with opposites. So when you're feeling light, you have to bring in grounding energy. So when I am feeling that, I feel my seat in the chair, or I feel my feet on the floor, or I'll breathe deeply down into my belly, like the shape of a mountain to feel that, you know, coming from a smaller point to a bigger point to really ground my mental energy into my body so that I can show up as myself without whatever those voices are that we all have in our heads that say, no, you're not this, you can't, you shouldn't, who are you? Don't be big for your boots. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'd like to say one more thing before, just because I'm on that. What I realized in October in 2020 is I've always heard, don't be, well, in Scottish, because my parents are Scottish, oh, you don't be too big for your boots or don't be too big for your bloody boots. 
That's what I would hear. Well, what I realized, not only do I not, it's not about being big for my own boots. I have never been too small for my boots. My boots fit me and I'm wearing the right boots. And so it's time for me to start walking and sharing and do what I'm here to do. Amen. Amen. I, it's something I mean, I mean, I asked, I, I drilled down on this question with you because I, 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 I suddenly got that as soon as you said, a, you know, how you show up, I thought, oh my gosh, that, that is exactly where I'm at and what I've been trying to work through in the past couple of years is that sense of, well, I've got this thing that I want to talk about and I want to say, and I want to explore. And if I start a podcast, who am I to do that? I'm not an expert. I have no, you know, but it's the, the sense of mission is just pulling me right through it. And every, every, Every time that I can tap into that, then I'm able to get out of my own way of not feeling like I'm enough. And I go into Clubhouse almost as a challenge. I make myself get up and and get on stage, as you say, because, um, you know, I have a, a, a background in in acting as, as anybody who listens to the podcast knows, uh, you know, comes up every now and again. And I am fully comfortable on stage with a script and rehearsals and all the, you know, the stuff that goes with the production, or if I give up, get up to give a speech, as long as I'm prepared, I'm good. But getting up to talk extemporaneously in front of people gives me the flop sweats And I'm very likely to cry because I get so moved by what I'm saying. And so I go into clubhouse and I make myself do it. And it's, it, it's odd because I get sweaty under, under my armpits every single time, but it's like working a muscle, you know, and I'm slowly learning how to get comfortable with my own voice because it's like you said, I think it it matches up with what you were saying. It's not about me. It's about what the conversation is about and what and where we're going with that conversation, you know? Yeah. Yvonne, what's the word you used about um, what kind of pushes you? There was a word there that you used, like you're, there's something you keep going back to where it's what puts you out there. What is that driving force that you said that there's like a message? Mission. Mission. Exactly. Mission. Mission. That's the key. So if you look at your life, like I didn't know all that about you. And and it's ironic because I think the last thing I could do ever is act. Yet I feel like I'll be able to get up in front of 10,000 people and talk, even though I wouldn't say that I'm a public speaker. But if you ask me to act, there's something about that. So that driving force, that mission, when I spoke earlier about the universe is guiding me or whatever the guides are that you believe in your life. If you start to really look at your life and what got you here to this moment, right now in this moment, the skills that you have to do what you're doing, you'll see that you acquired something along the way that enabled you to arrive to where you are today. So that mission, that voice inside that mission, it's the same thing with me. Like that's what won't make me stop because the times, you know, you asked about me shining my light and what helps me go forward. What helps me go forward, I was sharing, but I'll also tell you what helps me not go back. Because what helps me not go back is even if it's scary, which it is, every day it's scary, everything I'm doing, my YouTube channel, my webinar that's coming up on bone health that could potentially have a couple hundred people in it. Every time I put something on my calendar to put out there, the butterflies will start. But what really keeps me going is this. If I think about stopping and not wanting to deal with the butterflies or the scary, that's not an option. Mm -mm. There's no option for me. If I think of me sitting down and saying, forget this, it's too hard. There's too many things to do. I can't, it's too scary. (laughs) It doesn't feel like an option for me to do that. It make it, it's like, there's still this drive. You call it your mission. For me, there's this driving force that keeps pushing me saying, okay, do you want something else for me to give you? I, br- I broke your hip for you. <laughs> Can I give you another ailment? So I'm like, no, no, 
I'll listen. <laughs> okay, I'll go out there. I'll, I'll tell them, you guys, this is what's ahead. Stop. You got to take care of your body and your mind now. You got to, you can't, don't arrive to 80 broken. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a mission and then it's it's the mission like comes up to your back right you once you go one step forward or say two steps forward and your mission has pushed you two steps forward mm-hmm. and even if you wanted to turn around and run away uh-uh there's the mission saying <laughs> oh, no you don't turn around i'm pushing you forward so that mission or that drive is just psh, pushing yeah oh i just wish for everybody to find that thing for themselves, whatever is going to drive them forward. So, oh, so great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I want to ask you, I, I mean, I know you've got the thing on bone health coming up. What, what, what are you most excited about right now? Is, is that it? Is it? No, I've got other things, but I just wanted to finish what you just said about people finding themselves, you know, that are listening, right? People might find themselves in the same place. Yes. I would say that the key is to listen to listen to that inner voice, that inner drive, that inner mission, whatever it is for you. And the way you listen is to be quiet, is to not bring in anything through your senses. So the word could be called meditation. It could be called mindfulness, concentration, whatever it is you wanna call that. When you sit in um, peace, when you don't bring in anything for stimulation and you sit and you connect to your breath, the signs start to show up for you. Yeah. You start to become guided in life. Yeah. And I would add to that, um, absolutely all that. And I would add to it with that awareness to have a sense of curiosity that comes with it. And, and because they're 10, you know, I know for myself, you know, there's a, there's also a judgment. So like coming up with the the awareness sometimes triggers judgment of myself and what I've just witnessed. And so I would just encourage anybody who's, who's doing this to stay curious and kind to yourself in that awareness so that you can look at it with, without judgment and without coming down on yourself. Yeah. And then ask yourself who's judging Mm-hmm. And where did that come from? Is that my mother or my grandmother? Is that my that husband? some kid in Is junior high friend? who said something to me over right. and over? Right? So you start to look, yeah, you start to listen. Right. Um, okay, so, so what is it that I do? What am I passionate about? What am I sharing? So I do five live classes a week. So for those that are not self-motivated, I actually teach five classes a week. I really specialize in bone health and maintaining our body and mind as we age. So I like to say the 55 plus crowd. Although of course, if somebody had issues, um, it would be okay for anybody to come. And so the five live classes are there. And then I have courses. I have online courses for stress management, for bone health, for aging gracefully. And I have an upcoming four week interactive course for bone health lifestyle. So I I teach and I'm happy to guide people. I really want to empower people to heal themselves and share the tools with them so that they can actually bring into their lives, daily habits, lifestyles, behaviors, and routines to have a stronger body, a stronger mind. So I have a powerful lifestyle courses where I share wisdom for people to implement daily habits and routines into their lives. In mid-April, I have one on bone health or osteoporosis. And in May, I have one on aging gracefully. And that is tools for us to keep our mind and body as strong and healthy as possible as we age. Fantastic. Fantastic. Before I let you go, can I, can I press you for your number one bone health tip? So number one bone health tip would be something I call vitamin T as in the letter T and it's tree pose which is a single leg balance. And the reason why is because stress in the right way, using stress as our friend will cause a reaction. And when you stand on one leg and you balance on one leg, you are straight, your hip joint, the pelvis, the upper leg bone, the neck of the femur, the most precarious part of your body to fracture if you fall is that part of your body. And you're working on balance communication throughout the body of the proprioceptic nervous system 
from the ground to your mind. So a tree pose, a single leg balance pose, vitamin T, I recommend that everybody does it, not just one time a day. And you can do this when you're washing dishes, when you're standing waiting for something to heat up, when you're having a conversation with someone, or when you need to take a break from sitting for too long. Ah, I like it. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for, for joining me today and, um, and everything. And so w- real quick before we go, I mean, I'm going to have all kinds of links in the show notes for people, but what's um, the best place for somebody to go to find the tap to all things Debbie? Um, DebbieRobinson.com. And I spell Debbie D-E-B-I. R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N.com. Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. Wow. I want to talk about mission for a second. Mission with a capital M. You, You know, it occurs to me that what pulled Debbie out of her low point was having a mission, or as she calls it, a drive to help others avoid what happened to her. I hear the same idea over and over again. That if we want to help ourselves, the best thing to do is help others. Oh, there's this quote I love that was food for thought for me and led me in no small way towards doing this podcast. Here's the quote. You ready? The best way to not feel hopeless is to get up and do something. Don't wait for good things to happen to you. If you go out and make some good things happen, you will fill the world with hope you will fill yourself with hope. That's a quote from Barack Obama. I have found that to be so true. Doing this podcast has filled me with hope. Thank you so much for coming on this journey with me. It truly fills my cup. I'm getting a little bit clumped. <laughs> hey, um, before you get on with the rest of your day, can you take a moment, if you haven't already, to leave a review or rating or let a friend know about the podcast? Uh, yeah, reviews help other people find the podcast and I'd really appreciate it. And if you want to know more about Debbie, I will have that information for you in the show notes. Just go to latebloomerliving.com forward slash podcast and click on the show notes for episode 45. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.